Leviticus chapter number 10. While you're turning there, uh, well, I want to say I enjoyed that. I, I uh, of course, we sing, you know, and I believe in practicing. I believe in, I started to say doing your best, but uh, we, we learned this week that that's not good enough. But uh, but I, I do believe in trying to practice, you know, and but, uh, boy, there's nothing that beats that impromptu worship of the Lord and what we just heard a while ago. And uh, I do want to say this, uh, I, I would uh, invite y'all to our camp meeting, Brother uh, Womper, if you don't mind me plugging ours just for a second. Um, we're having our camp meeting in October, it'll be uh, the uh, 8th through the 11th, That, if I got my dates right, 8th or 9th, that's Sunday. That's bad when you don't even remember your own dates, but uh, October 8th through the 11th, that's Sunday through Wednesday night, uh, we have our camp meeting there at Union. And this is our, uh, I didn't realize this till the other day, but this is our 50th camp meeting. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's been bigger in the past, and Lord willing, we want to get it, we want to build it back up. It's kind of declined. Actually, ever since Brother Rusty left, it's kind of been in decline ever since then, but we want to get it built back up. And uh, so you're invited to come and be with us if, if you're able to. Well, I Brother Bobby Barnes there, and Brother Ricky Gravely will be there with us, and then we'll have some other preachers there as well. Uh, some friends of mine from Texas, Lord willing, will be there, Brother Trenton Stevix, and, uh, and so uh, there'll be some good preaching, and uh, we invite you to come, and uh, boy, this is, we're, we're excited, this is our 125th year anniversary of the church, and uh, we're, we're excited what the Lord has done. We had, a, we had an older gentleman uh, that, uh, that was a member of the church years ago, he came by, he was part of the Chance family. Uh, that was member of the ch- members of the church years ago, and he got saved there at Union 50 years ago, and he lives in Kentucky now, and I guess he's in his 80s. And uh, he came by the church two Sundays ago, and, and uh, we walked out there that Monday. Uh, he stuck around, went out there to, to the old property that Monday and walked around, and boy, he was giving me a history lesson of uh, uh, walking around those the old grounds where our old church building is. And, uh, and this, this, we're in our fifth building now. Uh, from when the church was started in 1898, and uh, boy, he was walking around and he showed me the outline, and I, I'd seen in the grass the outline, and uh, but never really, it never, I never put two and two together. I'm not that bright, but uh, but he was showing me. He said, "But this is the outline of the uh, of the previous building before the one that's that's we're about to tear down now." And uh, but he was walking around and. And show me he was he was pointing out this is where the baptistry was and this is where the pulpit stood and this is where the amen corner was and it was just a wonderful history lesson we're thankful for the for the history and the, our heritage there well <clears throat> Leviticus chapter number 10 I almost don't know what to do with this this morning Leviticus chapter number 10 Look at verse number 1. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And they went out, uh, there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Lord willing, for a few minutes this morning, I want to preach to you on this thought on strange fire. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, Lord, I do thank you for this day. Lord, we do thank you, Lord, for the opportunity, Lord, and the privilege, Lord, to be here, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for the, the messages, Lord, that we've heard this week, Lord, and how our hearts have been stirred, Lord, and, Lord, how you've moved among us, Lord, and how you've touched us, Lord. And, and Lord, it's been said already this morning, Lord, but we pray, Lord, that you would do it again, Lord, today. Lord, we need, Lord, last night was great, Lord, and yesterday was great. But, Lord, we need a touch from you today, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you would meet with us this morning, Lord, get, every, get us out of the way, Lord, and I pray that you would be glorified and magnified and honored this morning and this evening, Lord, and the closing services of this meeting, Lord. I pray that you would meet with us and touch us, Lord, and bless us, Lord. I pray that you'd meet with us this morning, Lord. In Christ's name I do pray. Amen. Well, they, uh, as you come here to Leviticus chapter number 10, uh, as you make your way to this passage, you come through uh, these first few chapters of, of Leviticus and you, uh, you get through the end of Exodus and in the beginning of Leviticus, you'll find that the tabernacle has just been constructed. It's all brand new and, and they, they haven't sacrificed in the tabernacle before. They, they, this, is, this is all new to them. And yes, they have the tabernacle for, for the next 40 years. They carry it around through the wilderness before they go into Canaan. But 
but right now it's brand new. And here you have Nadab and Abihu. They've just been given uh, all the commandments from the Lord. This is how you do this. This is how you, uh, you bring this sacrifice. This is how I, I want this done. And you go through those first few chapters of, Levit- of Leviticus and the Lord is giving them the commandments and uh, telling them how they want things done. And then you get right here to chapter number 10 and Nadab and Abihu, they think they come up with a better way. They, uh, I mean, they've just been given the commandments from God, but, but, but they found a better way in their mind and they found a new way to do something. Uh, and they, they offer what the Bible says is strange fire. Now, before we get into that, I do want to give you just a little bit of background on Nadab and Abihu and talk about where they come from. First of all, I want you to notice about Nadab and Abihu and notice about their pedigree. They are the sons, the Bible says right here in chapter number 10 that they were the sons of Aaron. If you go back, if you go back to Exodus chapter number 6 and verse number 23, the Bible says that Aaron took uh, him Elishab, the daughter of Abinadab, the sister of Nashon, to wife, and she bare him Nadab and Abihu and Eleazar and Ithmar. These were the, uh, the sons of Aaron. They were, they were the very nephews of Moses. And boy, can you imagine the stories that, that, Ahab and, uh, uh, that Nadab and Abihu must have heard uh, coming up. Can you imagine how they were, must have been sitting around the tent at night and hear the stories about, uh, uh, about Miriam and uh, Miriam telling about when, uh, when they put Moses in the, in the, in the, in the water and, and how, about how God delivered. Because see, back then, families used to sit around and talk. They didn't sit around, they didn't sit around their cell phones back then, all in a circle, and everybody wa- watching the cell phone or with the earbuds in their ears or didn't sit around watching the TV. Boy, I remember going, families used to sit around and talk to each other. My mom is the youngest. My mom is the youngest of seven kids. And boy, I remember going to my grandparents' house when I was just a little boy coming up. And uh, I remember going to my grandparents' house. And my grandparents had a television set, uh, but but it only it stayed off 23 hours of the day. It came on at five o'clock in the afternoon for 30 minutes of the local news, and then 30 minutes of Jeopardy or Wheel of Fortune or whatever game show came on after that. And then it went off, and it didn't come on for another 23 hours. And when the family gathered there at my grandparents' house. They didn't sit around on their cell phones and they didn't sit around watching TV. Boy, they, 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 they come in and, and you talk about seven kids and uh, seven spouses and, and then all the grandkids. And, uh, and boy, it was a little bitty house, probably about 1,100, 1,200 square foot house. And boy, they would come in and they would set the chairs up in a big circle around the living room. Just everybody kind of get in where they could get in. And, and they would stand there, they would sit there and just talk and laugh and just have a, a good time and enjoying each other's company. And boy, I remember as a kid, I used to love to sit around and a lot of the kids would, would be out on the front porch playing and a lot would be running through the yard but a lot of times I would just want to sit there in the living room with the adults and, and listen to the stories that they had to tell. Boy, some of my greatest memories. Dad never started pastoring till I was 19 years old. So I, I, I didn't grow up uh, as a young boy in a preacher's home. But, but I can still remember, uh, even at 19 and 20 years old, uh, having preachers come through and being able to sit across the dinner table from men like Brother Stenard Blue and Brother Billy Goolsby and other, other men and missionaries and preachers that came through and be able to hear the stories that they told. And boy, I hung on every word. Those are precious memories. And I can imagine Nadab and Abihu, they had some precious memories uh, of, being, of, of sitting around with Aaron, uh, with, her, with her daddy Aaron and Uncle Moses and Aunt Miriam and, and hearing the stories about what the things that God did back in Egypt when they were in bondage and in slavery. Thought about their pedigree. Thought about not only their pedigree, but they were priests. The Bible says that they were set aside as priest. Now they didn't they didn't inherit this position because of who their daddy was, Aaron. They didn't inherit this position because of who their uncle was, because of Moses, because they were in the family. So they just automatically just kind of bumped them up and, and voted them in, but they were placed there by God in Exodus chapter number twenty eight, verse number one. God said uh, God said, And take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother and his sons with them uh, from the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest office, even Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithmar, Aaron's sons. So we see that they were, they were, they were touched by God. They were, uh, they were commissioned by God uh, to, to do this work of the priesthood. They just didn't inherit it. And boy, isn't it great to know when God has put His hand on you and has called you to a work and has set you aside and yeah, maybe you have detractors and doubters they are trying to tell you that you shouldn't do it but you know God spoke to your heart and put you in that position 
We see their pedigrees, we see their, that they were priests. We see their perception, talking about what they saw. Not only did they hear the stories of, uh, of, uh, of Uncle Moses and Aunt Miriam and, and, and Aaron, not only did they get to sit around and, and hear the stories, but think about the things that they saw. I mean, they were there at the crossing of the Red Sea. They saw the miracles about how God delivered and, and parted the sea and let them walk across on dry ground and, and how God drowned that Egyptian army. They saw that with their own eyes. But not only did they see that, but they saw God Himself. In Exodus chapter number 24, verse number 9, Then went up Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw God, the Bible says. Now, of course, they didn't see God's face. The Bible says that no man can see, God said, no man can see my face and live. But they saw the presence and the glory of God. Hey, we've gotten a glimpse this week of the presence and the glory of God. Hey, have you ever been in a service where you've seen the presence and the glory of God and just something unexplainable happened? That boy, there's just no way to explain it. There's no way to verbalize it. But you just know that God moved in. Well, I thought about Brother Finney talking about last night about that, that, about that service that stood out in his mind so many years ago. Uh, boy, every one of us have services like that. I remember one time being in a revival meeting. I think it was in 1999 or 2000 over at Brother Sammy Allen's church. And uh, they had one preacher got up and he preached. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and it was already late. And uh, Brother Sammy got up and he said, I think it's the Lord's will for us to have one more preacher. And, and in my mind, I'm sitting there thinking, Lord, Lord have mercy, I've got to go to work in the morning. I've got to drive back home. It's a 30-minute drive. I've got to be at work at 5 in the morning. I don't really want to hear another preacher. But oh, I'm so glad he did. I'm telling you what, the glory of God fell in that place that night. The power of God fell. And there were things that happened in that church that no human can explain away other than to say that God met with us. And just and today, 20-something years later, it still sticks out in my mind as one of the greatest services I've ever been in. Have you ever seen the presence of God fall in a service, move in your life? They saw the presence of God. Then we see their precedent. They had a precedent that was set for them. They had some examples in their lives. Young people, you have examples that are set in your life. And you can choose to follow the good examples or to follow the bad ones. We see, first of all, they had a choice example. Uncle Moses. Yes, Moses had his problems. And Moses was a man like any other man. And Moses had his areas of disobedience. But they they weren't preconceived. I mean, we know the time that, that, that Moses got mad and he struck the rock when he was supposed to speak to the rock, but he didn't get up that morning and say, I'm going to disobey God today. And Moses did his best to follow in the footsteps of the Lord in everything that he did. Turn over a couple pages to Exodus chapter number 40. Book of Exodus chapter number 40. <clears throat> As you get here to Exodus 40, uh, through the uh, several of the uh, previous chapters, the Lord is giving them the instruction. This is, how, this is how I want you to build the tabernacle. This is the materials that you're going to use. This is, how you're gonna, this is the, dimensions, as, as, uh, uh, the dimensions of how you're going to build the altar. This is the dimensions of how you're going to build the ark. This is, this is how I want it done. Instruction after instruction after instruction as he's going through uh, these previous chapters. And now as you get to chapter number 40, they've got and all the materials together and, and they've, they've, got, they've got the altar built and they've got the tabernacle built and now it comes and it's time to assemble them and watch in chapter number 40 and the Lord spake unto Moses in verse number 1 saying on the first day of the month uh, on, the first day of the, uh, on the first day of the first month shalt thou set up the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation and thou shalt put Therein the ark. Verse number 4. And thou shalt bring in the table. In verse number 5. And thou shalt set the ark of gold. In verse number 6. And thou shalt set the altar. In verse number 7. And shalt, thou shalt set the laver. In verse number 8. And thou shalt set up the court. In verse number 9. And thou shalt take the anointing oil. In verse number 10. And thou shalt anoint the altar. In verse number 11. And thou shalt anoint the laver. In verse number 12. And thou shalt bring Aaron. In verse number 13. And thou shalt put Aaron. Do you see? 
see a pattern here. Verse number 14, and thou shalt bring his sons. And verse number 15, and thou shalt anoint them. And look at verse number 16, and thus did Moses, according to all that the Lord had commanded him, so did he. Moses was obedient. He did his best. Yes, he was a man. Yes, he had faults and failures. But he did his best to follow the obedience and the commands of the Lord in everything he did. And it doesn't stop there. Look at verse number 21. And he brought the ark into the tabernacle and set up the veil of the covering and covered the ark of the testimony as the Lord commanded Moses. Verse number 23. And he set the bread in order uh, upon it before the Lord as the Lord commanded Moses. Verse number 25. And he lighted the lamps before the Lord and the, as the Lord commanded Moses. Verse number 27. And he burnt sweet incense thereon as the Lord commanded Moses. Verse number 29. And he put the, uh, the altar and the burnt offering of the door of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation and offered upon it the burnt offering and the meat offering as the Lord commanded Moses. Verse number 32. And, and when they went into the tent of the congregation and when they came near unto the altar they washed as the Lord commanded Moses. Moses followed God in everything he did. In every, in every way he tried his best to please God. And they had that example in their life of Uncle Moses following the commandments of the Lord. But then we see they also, not only did they have that choice example, but we see they had a corrupt example. Even in their own father, Aaron. Who back in Exodus chapter number 32, you remember when Moses went up and on the, up on the mountain with God and uh, he was up there for 40 days and the children of Israel, they came to Aaron and said, you know, we don't know what's going on with this guy Moses. We don't know what's happened to him. He brought us up out of the land of Egypt and now he's just left us out here to abandon us. Make us a God. You know the story about how Aaron commanded them to, to bring the gold and to bring, to, to bring everything they had and he, he fashioned, the Bible said, he fashioned that graven image. We see that he entered into idolatry and began to worship a false god. We see later on as Moses came down off of the mountain and he comes back down, we see the excuse that Aaron gives. He said, well, I just threw this in the fire and it popped out. Then he begins to lie and to try to cover his tracks. And we see that they had, they had that great example from their uncle Moses of how to follow God and how to live for God. But then we see they had that bad example, that corrupt example from their own father. And then we see their problem. Talking about these two men, Nadab and Abihu. We see that their problem, the Bible said in chapter number 10 of Leviticus, that they offered strange fire to the Lord. Now, what is that supposed to mean? Okay, we talked about how as you come through those last chapters of the, uh, of the book of Exodus, how God is uh, commanding them to, to, to bring all the materials, and they did that. He gave them the dimensions uh, for the altar, for, for the ark, for, uh, for the candlestick, for the table. He gave, them, he gave them the dimensions and materials for all that. They've got all that put together. They finally put the tabernacle together. Then you get, you get into Leviticus chapter number 10. Now, it's still brand new. It hasn't been used yet. But now you get into Leviticus chapter number, ten, uh, chapter number 1 and through those first nine chapters, God is giving the commandments. This is, this is how you offer an offering for a sin offering. This is how you offer the offering for a burnt offering. This is what you do for, for this problem. This is what you do for the sin of the people. This is what you do for the sin of the priest. Uh, those first few chapters of, of Leviticus, He's just giving them the, these instructions. But then you get to Leviticus chapter number 6. My Bible's new, excuse me, the pages are still stuck together. You get to Leviticus chapter number 6. Now God gives him special instructions about this fire. See, the fire that God has on the altar is no ordinary fire. It's God's fire. It, you'll, you'll find out here in a minute uh, over in Leviticus chapter number 9 that it was God who started the fire. They didn't start the fire, God started the fire. And in, and, in, and in Leviticus chapter number 6, in verse number 12, God said, now the fire's not lit yet. He's given them instructions. Here's what's going to happen. He said, and the fire upon the altar shall be burning in it. It shall never be put out. It shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning and lay the burnt offering upon it. And he shall burn thereon the fat of the peace offering. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. 
And what God is saying here is once that fire is lit, it's never going to go out. And we see that the children of Israel did that for the remainder of those 40 years and, uh, that they wandered in the wilderness. And as they crossed over uh, the, jo- uh, the, the river Jordan and went into Canaan land, that fire was always lit. It never went out. Uh, yes, there, there may have been times where, but you say, well, how in the world did they do that? You see, they were to carry that, al- that, al- that altar just as they, they were to carry the ark. You remember the story of Uzzah over there. Uh, <clears throat> when Deborah, when, uh, <clears throat> of course, it was mentioned the other night when David was bringing the Ark of the Covenant uh, back to Jerusalem, how they put it on that cart and, you know, they were supposed to carry it on the staves. They had the rings on, on each side and they were supposed to stick the, the staves through and each man was to get up and to carry that Ark like that, one man on each corner. Uh, and they were supposed to do the altar the same way. And so what had happened is... What, what, what would happen is as they, were, as they would wander in the wilderness, when it was time to move, they would, they would carry that altar and those coals would still be on that altar. And they would get to the next place where they would travel and they would set it all back up and, and they wouldn't start a new fire. They would just dig around in those coals and those ashes and put that wood in and get that old fire stirred back up. And there's really kind of two applications we can get from that. The first one is that whenever you get saved, it's not, it, hey, you don't get saved in and of yourself. It's, it's the Spirit of God. It's the working of God. It's the moving of God in your life. And that fire that God lit on the inside of you when, in, when you got saved, it'll never go out. It'll never be put out. You'll never lose your salvation. That's God's fire that's burning on the inside of you. Now, it's you and I's, it's our responsibility to keep that fire going and to keep that fire stoked. And boy, we can let let it get down to ashes sometimes and let it get down to where it's just smoldering and we get cold and indifferent and get away from God. But the fire will never go out. <clears throat> but here's the problem. You say, you say over in Leviticus chapter number 9, Leviticus 9, 24, and there came a fire out from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar. And the burnt offerings and the fat which all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their face. So in chapter number 9, verse number 24, now God lights the fire. They said there came a fire out from before the Lord. I don't know if he lit it by a lightning bolt. I don't know if he, I don't know if he sit down a ball of fire out of heaven. But God lit the fire on the altar and it was to ever be burning. But see, Nadab and Abihu, for some, now they've just witnessed all this. They've just, they've just seen all this firsthand. About, they heard with their own ears the commandments of God. And boy, they watched Uncle Moses put all these things together and direct all the workers to put the tabernacle together just as God has commanded. They've heard with their own ears the commandments of God. You are to worship this way. You are to do things this way. And now they've seen with their own eyes God send down the fire from heaven and light the fire. They've heard the commandments. That the fire is to ever be burning. And if, if we're going to offer anything to God, we're going to have to offer God's fire, not our own fire. But it's in the, the Nadab and Abihu, the Bible says, they got censers in their hands. And instead of going over there and, and getting fire off the altar from God's fire and offering their incense, offering their praise, offering their worship of God, they came over here and got another fire. They started another fire. And offered from that. And for that God killed them. Hey, they, they weren't guilty. They weren't guilty of idol worship like their father Aaron was. And they, they were worshiping the one true God. But they were worshiping God the wrong way. And that's still wrong today. Our worship must be according to scripture or must worship must be according to the principles that God has set out in his Bible we're not supposed to take some other way we're not supposed to take some other strange fire and offer to God we're supposed to go- offer God his fire in our worship just a couple of things about this real quick and we'll be done a couple of things about our worship when we come to God first of all our worship must be scriptural our worship must be scriptural. And I thank God for the things that we've seen and heard this week. I say amen to everything that we've seen and heard here. This, this isn't a criticism of anything here. Please, please don't take it wrong. Or please don't take, take anything that I'm saying as a criticism. It is absolutely not. Everything here has been wonderful. But I'm saying our scriptural, our worship must be according to the Bible. 
It must be according to Scripture. When Jesus was talking to that woman at the well in John chapter number 4, Jesus said, They that worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. There's two, two, uh, two rules that we have to follow in our worship. It has to be according to the Spirit. It has to be in the Spirit. It has to be according to truth. Our worship must be in the Spirit. How many times have we come to church and our hearts aren't prepared to come to the house of God? How many times have we come to church and, boy, we haven't taken time to read and pray and to, to get our hearts right? And, and boy, we come in and uh, we, we, we sing the songs and we kind of mumble through and, and count the ceiling tiles while we're going through the song service. And then the preacher gets up to preach and we're daydreaming about what's, what's gotta, what we got to do tomorrow and what we're going to eat for supper that afternoon and our, our hearts hearts and our minds are nowhere on the worship of God and then we leave church and we wonder what in the world's wrong with the preacher why, why, what was wrong with the preacher I just didn't get anything out of the service well you didn't get your heart prepared you didn't get your heart right you didn't try to take time and, and, and get alone with Jesus before you came to church it's not the preacher's fault it's your fault so we have to prepare. Our worship must be in spirit. We just can't come. Boy, as independent Baptists, we're good at coming through the doors and going through the motions and condemning that strange fire down the road. Those Pentecostals, boy, they're just emotional and they're just in it for the emotion and they are. And boy, But we've got the truth right here. We've got the King James Bible. It's rightly divided. We know where we stand. We're worshiping God in truth, but we have no spirit to us. And the Bible says that we have to have both to worship Him. It has to be in spirit and it has to be in truth. It has to be according to the Word of God. And I'm telling you what, uh, those that say, boy, you ought not to lift your hands, the Bible commands us to lift our hands. Those that say, boy, you ought not shout and get emotional in church, the Bible commands us to shout and to get emotional in church and to praise God and to thank Him for what He's done for us. It's still scriptural to praise God. It's still scriptural to lift a holy hand. It's still scriptural to say amen and to thank God for what He's done in our lives. In Psalms chapter number 63, verse number 4, the Bible says, Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. Psalms 134, 2. The Bible says, Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. You read Psalms chapter number 150 and all the things that the Lord says about praising God. The Bible says, Praise you the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in the firmaments of His power. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the psaltery and heart. Praise Praise Him with the timbrel and dance. Praise Him with the stringed instruments and organs. Praise Him upon the loud cymbals and praise Him upon the highest sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. It's still scriptural to praise God in church. It's still scriptural to lift up a holy hand and say thank you Lord for what you've done for me. Because uh, hey, without God, where would we be this evening? We wouldn't be in a church on a Thursday morning. Boy, it amazes me. It amazes me. Boy, our, we ought to have some zeal and some excitement for, for the Lord and for what He's done for us. Boy, people get excited about so many other things in this world and they get excited about football and they get excited about baseball. Lord, who in the world could get excited about baseball? But they get excited about all these other things and they come to church and there's no excitement. Lord, have mercy. In Romans chapter number 6, in Romans, you don't have to turn there, but in Romans chapter number 6, the Bible said, but thanks be God. In verse number 17, the Bible says, but thanks be God that you are the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart of that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, you became servants of uh, righteousness. In verse number 19, he said, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmities of your flesh, for as ye have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness, and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants to righteousness, unto holiness. He said, just like you used to live for the world, just like that zeal and excitement that you had when you lived in this world, just like that that the excitement. Well, I've never met. Hey, I, I've been I've been full time. I've been a full time pastor for three months now. I've I, I, I've worked a secular job all my life up till three months ago, from the time I was fourteen years old. And you see these people on the job when Friday night rolls around. I've never seen one of them say. 
Man, it's Friday night. I got to go to the bar tonight. <laughs> How many times have you seen one say, Boy, it's Saturday night. Man, I, I got to go get, I don't want to go to the bar, but man, I got to go. No, they're excited. They're happy about it. They're enjoying their sin. They're living in their sin. And uh, uh, David, uh, Paul said uh, there in Romans chapter number 6, he said that same excitement that you used to have for this world, that same zeal that you used to have for this world, he said now you need to live with that same excitement and that same zeal. You need to live for God with that excitement. Boy, it ought to excite us to come to church. It ought to excite us to come to camp meeting. It ought to excite us to hear the songs of God sung. And to hear his name lifted up. Yeah. Our worship must be in truth. But then our worship must be sanctified. It must be set apart. We're not, we're not supposed to take this strange fire over here and offer it to God. That, that's, that's the world's fire. We're, we're supposed to take the fire that God started in our heart. That, that's the fire that we're to offer to him. And when we try to incorporate the ways of this world into our worship service, when we when we want to when we want to change the, the 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 colored lights up here and have the smoke machines and that's that strange fire. If you were to go on YouTube and if you pull up a worship service and you mute it, and you're only watching it, and by watching it, you can't tell if you're watching a worship service or a rock concert. That's strange fire. Come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. We're not to offer, we're not to bring strange fire to God. We're not to incorporate this world's system into our worship. That's why God killed Nadab and Abihu. They weren't worshiping a false god. They were worshiping the true God. But they were doing it their own way. And God killed them for it. And you and I, hey, our worship must be scriptural. It must be according to the word of God. I'm bothered today about the incorporation of contemporary Christian music into our churches. It bothers me. Probably the biggest name in contemporary Christian music is Lauren Daigle. And somebody was interviewing Lauren Daigle the other day, and or this has been a while back actually. And somebody was interviewing her the other day, and they said, hey, at the end of the interview, they said, you know, who does Lauren Daigle listen to? They said, when you're just around your house, and you know, you've got earbuds in your ear, and who do you listen to on a daily basis? And she said, well, I've been listening to Billie Eilish a lot right now. I hope you don't know who that is. I didn't know, so I had to look it up. And I wish I hadn't. Billie Eilish had a song a few years ago, All the Good Girls Go to Hell. In the video of that song, she is in a, at the beginning of the video, she's in a white room, everything is white, she has white wings on, and all of a sudden these hands grab her and the screen goes dark. And then she's, the next scene you see she's falling through a dark sky. And she lands in a pool of oil or whatever it is. And then she begins to sing. The lyrics of the song says, My Lucifer is lonely. Standing there killing time. Parents, you better check your kids' playlist on their phone. Standing there killing time, can't commit to anything but a crime. Peter's on vacation, an open invitation. Pearly gates look more like a picket fence. All the good girls go to hell. Because God herself has enemies. And once the waters start to rise, and heaven's out of sight, she'll want the devil, she want the devil on her side. That is the person who is most influential over the most influential contemporary Christian music artist that there is. A strange fire. That doesn't honor God. If you think that someone like that could honor God, there's something wrong. 
By the way, by the way, probably 90% of the professional quote unquote Southern gospel groups are just as bad. Now, I'm not picking on singers. I love singing. I love good, godly, spiritual, spirit-filled singing. I love the, the singing that we've heard this week. There again, this is not a criticism at all to anything here. I promise you it's not. I'm just, I'm giving a warning. I'm giving a warning. we got some friends of ours that go to a church in Georgia. We used to live in Georgia years ago. Got some friends of ours that go to a church in Georgia. It's a good friend of mine, a good brother. I've known him. I've known him ever since I was a teenager. We're still good friends today. And he goes to church with a man that used to be on the road crew with the Gaither Vocal Band. He would go in and set up and help set up for the music and stuff like that. And so anyway, he was under contract with the Gaither Vocal Band. <clears throat> And so there was one Sunday come around. It was Super Bowl Sunday one year. And, you know, it, no, nobody had to, the Gaithers book to sing because they were all busy watching the Super Bowl. And, of course, if they're not busy, I mean, if they're not booked to sing, why would they go to church if they're not getting paid to go sing? And so they weren't planning on going to church anywhere. And so this fellow, this fellow went to Bill Gaither and he said, look, he said, we're just a couple hours from, from where I live, from where, I'm, where, where my home is. Hey, you know, I, I'd like to go home and, and see my family. I, I haven't seen them in a couple months. You know, I've been gone, been traveling on the road. Uh, can, can I go home? Can I drive home and go see my family and go to, go to church with my family Sunday? Uh, he said, no, you're under contract. You have to stay here. And he said, but no, look, we're, we're only two hours away. It's not, I, I could drive there and be right back. There's nothing going on. He said, no, you have to stay here. And he said he sat there that Sunday, Super Bowl Sunday, on the bus, and watched Bill and the boys play cards all day instead of going to church somewhere. A strange fire. A strange fire. Our worship must be scriptural. Our worship must be according to the Word of God. Why do people prefer strange fire? Why, why do people prefer this strange, offering strange fire to God? I thought about just a few things and we'll be done. First of all, it exalts self. He says, because see, that, that fire that God started, that's God's work. If, if you go over here and offer a strange fire, then that's your work. That's something that you've done. That's something that you've produced. That's something that you've worked up. And now you're offering that to God. But God said, that's not good enough. Hey, just like the preacher preached the other night, our best isn't good enough. Hey, it's all righteousness or it's filthy rags. If we're going to offer anything to God, it has to be what He started in our lives. And strange fire exalts self. Look what I did. Look what I did for God. Look what I've accomplished for God. It exalts self. It's ecumenical. No, we're not, we're not going to exclude anybody. You can, you, you can worship God in your sins just like the preacher was preaching the other night. Letting people up here on the platform and sing and perform and living in all kind of wickedness and sin. A strange fire. It's ecumenical. And it's easy. Well, it's not hard to start a strange fire. It's all about emotional feelings. God's fire takes work. God's fire takes work. Psalms chapter number 39 and we'll be done. Psalms chapter number 39. David said, I will... I said, I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. I was dumb with silence. I held my peace even from good and my sorrow was stirred. He said, my heart was hot within me. And while I was musing, the fire burned. When we offer worship to God, it can be a worship of our own hands, of our own fire. But how do we do this? We're talking about, talking about God's fire taking work. We have to study. David said, I will take heed to my ways. 
Boy, we have to put ourselves under a microscope. We have to put our lives under a microscope. We have to take heed to the things that we do and how we live and the way we walk. We have to examine ourselves. I ask you this. The, you know, we sing the song, He's Still Working on Me. To make me what I ought to be. It took Him just a week to make the, the, the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. But we sing that, we sing that song to the little kids. But it's true with you and I as well, is it not? That, that God is still working on us. I mean, have you arrived yet? Is, is, is God still working on you, on your life? I mean, the the, the song is is just as true for a 45-year-old as it is a 5-year-old. But here's the question. Now, I I realize when when, when a person gets saved, I realize when a person comes to to God in salvation, uh, boy, everything is new, and and boy, everything is wonderful, and you've got so much in your life that, that you have to change. But... If God is still working on you, when is the last time He's changed something in you? When is the last time God has put His finger on your life, on something in your life, and said, I don't like this? Change it. You say, Well, I've been preaching 20 years. Is God still working on you? When is the last time? God has put a finger on your life and said, change this, and you didn't come to God and say, with some kind of excuse, or you didn't go flipping through the Bible looking for some kind of verse to prove your point where you could stand on your sin and keep it, but you got down on an altar and you said, Lord, I'm sorry, I love this, it's been a hindrance in my life, but God, I surrender it to you. We have to take heed to our ways. Talk about this, this fire of God taking work in our hearts and in our lives. We have to shut up. We have to study. We have to shut up. He said that I sin not with my tongue. And boy, he keeps, he keeps, boy, he, he emphasizes this over and over again. He said, I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. I was dumb with silence. I held my peace. Boy, he just keeps going on and on about keeping his mouth shut. There might be some importance there. getting on our face before God, shutting our mouth and allowing God to work in our hearts. We have to spend time with the Lord. This doesn't happen all of a sudden. God's fire, hey, when when we let God's fire, when we let that fire die down in our life and it's just a few ashes and a few embers sitting there, it's not going to catch like that. It takes some time to get going and to get started again. But he said, David said, while I was doing that, he said, my heart was, my heart was hot within me. And while I was musing, the fire burned. Well, have you ever been cold and indifferent to God? Maybe just maybe away from maybe you, you didn't get out of church and and boy you didn't you didn't get off in some deep sin and you're still faithful to church Sunday morning Sunday night and Wednesday night but boy there's just uh, there's just something that's not you're just going through the routine it's just mechanical it's become mundane it's not exciting anymore it's uh, boy you're just there and there's no fire burning you you still got some embers there but it's not a raging fire. Well, I remember one time we lived in when we were still living in Georgia before the Lord had called me to preach, and we were members at Brother Goolsby's church, Brother Billy Goolsby. And I, someone had sent me a tape, <laughs> show my age, a preaching tape. And I'd, I'd put the tape in and not thinking a whole lot about it. I just thought, well, and I'd got it in the mail several weeks before, and it just sat around the house, and I hadn't touched it, I hadn't listened to it. And I just plugged it in and kind of started going about my day. And then it started up, it started right in the middle of a man of God, preaching 90 miles an hour. And boy, something began to stir. Something began to stir around on the inside. Something began to something began to well up on the inside of me that said, "Boy, don't you remember? Don't you remember when you used to when you used to read your Bible? Don't you remember when you used to be faithful to pray? Don't you remember when God's house was more than just going to church, but it was something special?" Amen. 
Boy, we need to get the fire stirred up in our hearts again. I thank the Lord for the meeting and for the preaching and for everything we've seen and heard this week. If you've not been stirred this week, there's something wrong. If, well, if something, and you may have been come, you may have come this week, and you but you may have come cold and indifferent. But but if something hadn't stirred around in the ashes of God's fire in your heart, you might want to check up and see if there's a fire there. You might want to check up and see if you've ever been saved. Lord, help us not to offer strange fire to the Lord, but to offer God's fire. To stay faithful to Him. To stay humble. To stay close to Him. To keep that fire going in our hearts and in our lives.